Welcome to Tales of American History, the Witnessing History Education Foundation podcast, educating Americans to understand the history of their country and of other countries so that they can better appreciate the value of America's unique free institutions. Become an American hero who participates in our mission by joining us at witnessinghistory.org, the website of the Witnessing History Education Foundation. Sign up on the website to receive the free monthly newsletter and to learn about the Foundation's many projects. Subscribe to the Witnessing History Education Foundation YouTube channel, where you can listen to all the podcasts and view all the documentary films for free. View also the Foundation's free teacher education materials and lesson plans that conform to grade-level education standards at pbslearning.org. Follow Witnessing History on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Now, take a journey back through time with Kent Masterson Brown and his guest and let their storytelling transport you to the most compelling moments in American history. Today, Kent's guest is Dr. Kenneth No, Emeritus Professor of History at Auburn. He is here to discuss his latest book, The Howling Storm, Weather, Climate, and the American Civil War. Listen to his fascinating description of weather as one of the agents of battle. Dr. No has written eight award-winning books, including the definitive history of the campaign and Battle of Perryville, which you will hear about in today's discussion. Welcome, Dr. No. Well, I'd like to welcome uh, to our podcast uh, today um, an old friend, uh, someone I met years ago working on, of course, Civil War projects. <laughs> Uh, it, at that time, the Perryville battlefield. Um, and it's, um, his name is Kenneth No, and he currently lives in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. Um, Ken um, went to Emory and Henry College. He earned uh, master's degrees at Virginia Tech and the University of Kentucky. And he received his doctorate from the University of Illinois in 1990. Um, he taught for almost a decade at uh, University of West Georgia, and then for what 21 years? 21 at Auburn University. And um, Ken has been a um, a noted uh, Civil War scholar for really all of his career. He has been the author or editor of eight books. Um, one of them was the, uh, the great book called Perryville, Grand Havoc of Battle that came out in 1997. And it stands as really the standard text um, of the campaign and battle of Perryville, Kentucky. And um, uh, it won uh, the governor's award here in Kentucky for its publication and the uh, Peter Searborg Award for Civil War History. Uh, Ken has um, produced in, in these eight volumes, virtually all of them have been award-winning books. One of them, uh, Southern Boy in Blue, uh, The Diary of a Kentucky Soldier, uh, in the 9th Kentucky Infantry. Those are, that's the United States troops. Um, it won the Tennessee History Book Award. And um, he's, um, he's had um, nominations for the Pulitzer a number of times, uh, nominations for the Lincoln Prize uh, numerous times. He has um, done terrific work in Civil War history. But what I want to talk with Ken about this morning is um, his most recent book that was published by Louisiana State University Press in 2020, and it's called The Howling Storm, Weather, Climate, and the American Civil War. Now, Ken, this is a, a topic I'm sure most people who are listening are almost startled about the fact that a book has been written about this? 
Um, tell me and the audience uh, how you became interested in chronicling weather and climate uh, for purposes of our understanding of the Civil War. When I was a kid growing up in Virginia, my grandparents owned a farm, and weather was very important to them. I mean, we had to know if it was going to rain. If it was, we needed to get the hay out of the field. Uh, we had to get ready for cold weather, bring the animals into the barn. So I grew up in a household that was very, very weather conscious to the degree that I learned pretty early that when the local weather broadcast was on, I had to be quiet. <laughs> I could talk during the news, but I couldn't talk during the weather. But somehow I never put the weather and the Civil War together in my mind until really the late 1990s mm -hmm. when you, Kent Brown, talked me into writing that Perryville book you just mentioned. <laughs> now, I think all the readers should know that Kent called me on the phone one day and verbally twisted my arm until I agreed to do it. <laughs> I knew the basics about Perryville, but I started my research, and I discovered pretty early on in the process that it was impossible to understand that battle without understanding the context of the weather. It took place in a drought, uh, and that drought shaped Every aspect of that campaign, it shaped the uh, Confederate line of march into Kentucky. It shaped um, the Confederates' decision to hold at Perryville. It shaped the battle itself. The battle began uh, early that morning on October 8, 1862, as a struggle over water. Right. So you, you couldn't understand Perryville without understanding the drought. More Recently, I've, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of the men at Perryville were just sick um, because they've been drinking anything they could find on the mm -hmm. way up from Alabama and Tennessee. And so a lot of them were just in terrible shape that day anyway. At any rate, I could not grasp the Battle of Perryville without understanding the weather. It was just as important as understanding the topography down mm -hmm. there. Right. And what I noticed is that when I would talk about Perryville— Two groups, or even in my classroom, I had to discuss the weather. And that sort of alerted me to thinking about how weather affected other battles and campaigns mm -hmm. in the war. So if I'm going to talk about the drought in the second half of 1862, well, I also had to talk about the heavy rains that took place in the first half of 1862 that shaped so many battles and campaigns, Fort Henry and Donelson, Shiloh. The Peninsula Campaign. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to talk about uh, Gettysburg mm -hmm. and the retreat from Gettysburg, a topic you've certainly written about, without dealing with the heavy rains that fell after that battle. So it started to seep into my lectures all the time. And I reached a point probably about 15 years ago where I used to have a throwaway line I would use in class. I would, I would say, somebody really needs to write a book about Civil War weather. Essentially, nobody ever did. So quite literally, I was sitting at breakfast one morning thinking about this, and I thought, well, okay, if no one else is going to do this, maybe I could give it a try. I had no idea what I was getting myself into mm -hmm. in terms of the sort of science I had to learn to actually do a decent job with it. But that's what led me there. Hmm. It's fascinating. Fascinating. And having seen your book uh, come out, um, it um, – uh, it struck me that we make so many value judgments about commanders, about armies uh, in the Civil War, and frankly, all military operations throughout history. And we just – we make those judgments without looking at things like weather, <laughs> uh, things like – are the troops hungry? Are the troops sick? Uh, and if so, how bad is that? Are the have the horses been fed? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I always say this when I've given lectures about Lee's retreat from Gettysburg or George Meade. You know, it took the Army regulations required you the, the 
a, a, a commander to make sure that those horses had 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day. And it was similar for mules, except they didn't eat oats. They ate a combination of grains. But, you know, you don't do that regularly. And in three days, that animal is lame. And he, he's on, it's on the brink of collapsing. Yes. And you get a, an army of, you know, George Meade's army had, what, 60,000 horses in it and nearly 30 plus thousand mules. And you say, uh, can he, is he getting the type of support from behind that can help him feed those people and those horses, those animals? And you think that sounds just boring and mundane, but it's just like the weather. Unless you consider, not only did it rain, but how bad was the rain? Yes. <laughs> how bad was the sleet? Uh, how deep was the mud? Um, then you can begin to get an understanding of what these people were facing. It's so, so essential to understand weather. And it's taken all this time, Ken, for someone to come out with a study about it, thanks to you, if we have one. Um, let, let, let's focus for a minute on... Um, uh, uh, one other aspect of, of, of this, and that is in the, in the 19th century, mid-19th century, 1850s, 1860s, during the time of the Civil War, was there in this country an active uh, attempt to chronicle weather? And if so, how was that accomplished? There was, and thank goodness, because it would have been hard to have written this book without it. In the 1840s, a handful of American scientists started to develop interesting theories about why the weather behaved the way it did in the United States and in the world. But they knew that they, they couldn't really establish even good hypotheses until they had some data. Mm -hmm. So beginning with the U.S. Army in the early 1840s, and then the Smithsonian Institution around 1844, uh, there's a national project to collect weather data from around the United States. And it's a really interesting story in and of itself. Essentially, the Smithsonian would seek out individuals in communities around the country and were willing to send them some pretty advanced instruments mm -hmm. in order to gauge barometric pressure, temperature, depth of rain. And in return, what these people had to do was go outside three times a day, 7 a.m., 2 p.m., 9 p.m., and fill out a form, write down the temperature, wind direction. There was a scale they used for how cloudy the sky was, barometric mm -hmm. pressure, all of that. And Every month when they filled out that month's form, they would send it to the Smithsonian in Washington. Mm -hmm. So beginning in the 1840s, there's this massive movement to collect data. The theory being that if enough data was amassed, then somebody could sit down and look at it and say, oh, look, there are patterns Look, it rained in Arkansas on Tuesday, and it rained in Kentucky on Thursday, and it rained in Maryland on Saturday. Maybe that's related. Mm -hmm. So you've got the system. It's going great guns, really, until 1861. With Confederate secession, it largely, though not completely, breaks down in the Confederacy. There are still some hardy souls in the South who can't stop. I, I always assume these are fairly obsessive people. <laughs> they can't stop. They keep doing it anyway. Uh, it certainly continues in the North. And so for the Civil War historian, there is this mass of data that we can use to understand weather conditions. We, we can know, as Bob Crick discovered years ago, he's actually the first person to really use this data um, and publicize it. Um, we know that 
the old story about people freezing to death at Fredericksburg the night of the battle has to be false because it never got down below 32 degrees. It didn't freeze at Fredericksburg. We know how much it rained between the Battle of Gettysburg and Lee's escape across Mm -hmm. the Potomac. We have that almost exactly because there's a weather observer in Gettysburg. Guy I love to talk about, by the way, <laughs> Professor Michael Jacobs at Pennsylvania College, who is literally out on Jan- on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd doing his daily recording during the battle itself. We have all that information. So there's this mass of, of data that's coming together. At the same time, um, U.S. Army surgeons at bases are supposed to be collecting this data for the use of the military. Uh, Some of that has survived. The U.S. Navy is keeping weather data in ship's logs, um, sometimes more effectively than elsewhere. It's a massive data on the blockade fleet on the East Coast. There's not much that's usable on the inland rivers. There is some material. There's just a massive data. And the idea was that once someone sifts through this, Patterns will emerge, and we will understand. This is an era before satellites. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually, I should mention, after the Civil War in the 1870s, the government brings all of these projects together and creates the Weather Bureau. And the Weather Bureau's charge is to find a way to predict the weather um, for the benefit of agriculture and commerce. It's really not until the 20th century that we begin to understand weather the way that we see it on television today with warm fronts and cold fronts and El Nino and, and everything that our local meteorologists talk about. But there's, there's an attempt here in the 19th century, and what it provides for those of us who are interested in the Civil War is just a wealth of data that we can use to, I think, flesh out battles, campaigns, uh, and life on the home front as well. Fascinating. Um, to do this work, I, you know, you, you uh, sat down with environmental historians. Mm-hmm. Imagine, I, you know, you, it's almost mind-boggling to think the specialties have gotten down that far. But, um, and, and in the process of your in, inquiry here, you found that there was, between 1856 and 1865, what is called the Great Civil War Drought. Tell us a little bit about that. The Great Civil War drought is a term that meteorologists use, especially meteorologists who are interested in historical data. And I discovered that they tend to kick it around pretty regularly, which shocked the heck out of me because (laughs) as a Civil War historian, I'd never heard of the Great Civil War drought. I'm not sure any of us had really. Because, you know, we all live in our academic silos, Sometimes I wouldn't even talk to the non-American historians, much less some scientist across campus. <laughs> Heavens, no. Um, so there actually is a drought that begins in the West in the 1840s. And it's really important, I think, for understanding the history of the United States in that period. Uh, in 1845, the Comanche Nation was incredibly strong. And was able to hold off both the American military and the Mexican military. What changed for the Comanche was drought. Drought killed the grass. Without grass, the buffalo died. Their culture started to decline. They were weakened enough that uh, those two armies could come in and start to claim territory. So this drought goes on for a while, but it really worsens in the late 50s. So exactly at the time of bleeding Kansas, uh, drought begins across Kansas. Uh, It hits the Indian Territory, modern Oklahoma, particularly hard to the point that those Native American nations that have left the southeast or the Midwest and have been forcibly moved out to the territory, I mean, they're in terrible shape. They're starving. Uh, They're dependent on government food coming in, which doesn't always arrive. Um, So they're in a terrible shape, not just um, in terms of food, but culturally economically. Uh, You see the same thing going on in Texas. So you've got this massive drought uh, that goes on really through the war in the West. It's a very dry period. Um, I think about um, Henry Sibley's Confederate campaign into New Mexico. You know, he's trying to get to Utah and ultimately he hopes California. He doesn't get that far. Uh, There's just not enough water out there. There's not enough grass to feed animals. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we think about Sibley's army marching back and forth from Texas, but in fact, they're not marching as an army. They're marching in little groups <laughs> because they all can't hit the water holes at once. Uh, it's a fascinating story, and I think it says a lot about our understanding of the relationship between the Civil War and the environment that we're only finding out about this drought now. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, quartermasters, who are the ones who, you know, uh, got the uh, feed to animals, um, oats, uh, hay, whatever, um, many times— um, in these campaigns, uh, there just wasn't enough supplies coming in from wherever the army was and wherever the supply base was uh, to feed those animals or to feed the men. And so they foraged uh, where they were, uh, uh, taking from farms, farmers, whatever they could find. Uh, giving them a note for it, you know, payable upon, you know, the Confederacy winning the war <laughs> at the end of the war or we'll pay you, the the United States will pay you for it if it's a Union army because they, they both did this. But if there's a severe drought, I mean, they don't even have that to fall back to. No, no, they don't. I think about Samuel Curtis's federal campaign through southern Missouri and Arkansas. He's trying to chase... Sterling Price's Confederates out of Missouri. They're trying to solidify Missouri for the Union. Mm -hmm. And what Curtis realizes, because he's good at this, he realizes that he can only take his army X number of miles. And where does he stop? He stops at a point where he can't feed his animals. You can load up a wagon train in Missouri, but you've got to feed the horses and mules that are pulling those wagons. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point where they're eating everything they can haul. Yeah. And that's where the, the campaign stops. Another okay. good example of that uh, is, frankly, with Abraham Lincoln, who throughout the war, really from, from the summer of 1861, is desperate uh, to liberate all those unionists in East Tennessee. And he's frustrated with general after general because they're all telling him there's not enough food and forage to take an army right. into East Tennessee, especially in fall and winter. It's, it's physically impossible to do. And it's incredibly hard to convince Abraham Lincoln of the fact. I mean, it looks feasible on a map. Right, right. You know, I say in, I say in Howling Storm, I think in some ways Abraham Lincoln was the first armchair general. <laughs> <laughs> I wound up giving him a hard time in George Meade's book, too, the book on George Meade, um, uh, as being that. Yes. Um, but, you know, to go into East Tennessee in those mountains, uh, you'd have to be a fool to do that. Yes. Thinking you could liberate them in that hill country, um, that's suicidal. I mean, the enemy can be on the bluffs overlooking you anywhere along the road. Um, this has happened time and time again in history. And sure. You just aren't able to take mountain country. And um, uh, I, uh, I sympathize with the frustration of people like Don Carlos Buell who commanded the Union Army that came into Kentucky for being hounded by the Lincoln administration to secure East Tennessee. It's, there's a passage in, in the official records, as, as you know, and many of our listeners know. Uh, Darlon, Don Carlos Buell essentially is put on trial mm -hmm. for poor performance during the Perryville campaign. He's dismissed from his command, and then they haul him back up to Ohio, and, and there's this hearing that takes place. And at one point during the hearing, they bring in his quartermaster. Mm -hmm. And the quartermaster is just listing fact after fact, but also he and others are pointing out conversations they had with people in Kentucky and Tennessee, all of whom were essentially saying – We've never seen a dry year like this. We've never seen such a lack of food and forage. These are unusual circumstances. I, I, I came to the conclusion that in wanting to focus on Nashville rather than East Tennessee, militarily at least, Buell was right. Yeah, right. Buell was right, but that was not what the politics of the time apparently needed. Mm -hmm. And it cost him his command. Yeah, it did. It did. Let's let's let's. Let's pursue the the Perryville campaign for a little bit here, sure. since we're we're on it. Um, we're here now in um, 
uh, September, August, September, October 1862. And um, General Braxton Bragg commands an army um, out of Chattanooga. Um, it, it's interesting. It had been brought by rail from Tupelo, Mississippi, yes. down to Mobile, Alabama, cross Mobile Bay, and then by rail to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta to Chattanooga. It's the largest transportation by rail of military forces in American history up to that point in time. 776 miles. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. And um, he uh, he launches an invasion of Kentucky, and um, he moves up into the into the state um, through uh, Glasgow, um, then straight up what is now Route 31E, <laughs> uh, if you uh, go on the map of present-day Kentucky. And he gets to Bardstown uh, after overwhelming a, a small force at Munfordville and um, gets to Bardstown, and behind him is coming Don Carlos Buell in his Union Army of the Ohio. Bragg's army is called the Army of the Mississippi or the Department of Mississippi. At that point. At that point. And um, uh, Buell chases him into Kentucky, and then as Bragg moves from Bardstown toward um, uh, toward what, what, what will be Perryville, uh, Buell, who has come out of, gotten as far as Louisville, uh, gotten reinforcements in Louisville, now comes out of Louisville, passes through Bardstown. He follows Bragg now. And um, tell uh, the, the viewer a little bit about uh, what this drought looked like, what the soldiers remembered. Um, uh, give us a little insight into that. Sure. Well, from the time the Confederates left Chattanooga and went over that imposing Walden's Ridge, which mm -hmm. is still fun to drive over today on the interstate, they encountered a lack of water because of the drought. The drought was settling in by that period. So it's hard to find. Sometimes officers are requisitioning it for themselves. Uh, there are men who are actually finding springs or pools, and they're trying to sell it to their comrades. And they're drinking what they can find. They're drinking rainwater out of potholes in the ground. They're drinking water from pools covered in scum. They're making themselves very sick. The Federals are doing the same thing. They're using this water to make bread. They are desperate for water as they move north. Um, Bragg reaches a certain point where he discovers that his intended route, because Bragg is trying to live off the country, his intended route will not work because there's not enough food, forage, water ahead of him. So he's shifting around, trying to find a way into Kentucky where he can feed his men and animals mm -hmm. as he goes. The Federals are following along. They're getting sick. Both armies are poorly supplied. They're furious with their commanding officers who are supposed to take care of them. But instead, they're hungry. They're thirsty. They're getting sick. Uh, the Confederates also have a nasty habit of uh, killing animals and leaving them in ponds before they pull out. So when the Federals come through, they can't drink the water because there's all this dead animal effluvia, effluvia floating around. <laughs> so the Confederates actually p finally pull into, into Bardstown. Federals go on to Louisville. Story I love to tell. Because of the drought, the Ohio River was so low when they arrived in Louisville that a lot of Hoosier soldiers who were fed up with Don Carlos Buell already, uh, they decided to desert, which normally would have been kind of tough since the Ohio River was in between Indiana and Louisville. But it was low enough that, that these guys just went to the falls and walked over and went home. <laughs> so here we are in this drought. Uh, eventually, um, Buell divides his army, but he sends most of it to the southeast toward Harrodsburg, Danville, eventually Perryville. The Confederates are retreating. The Confederates are also very confused. Um, a feint that Buell launched has completely befuddled Braxton Bragg and the other Confederate general operating in the area, Edmund Kirby Smith. But in fact, most of the army is moving eventually toward Perryville. Why Perryville? Why is there a battle there in the first place? When the Confederates pass through Perryville, 
they're supposed to be they're supposed to be moving through, not stopping. They notice there's some water there. There's not a lot. There are some springs. There are pools of water in the otherwise dry bed of the Chaplin River, which bisects the town. Uh, you've also got the Chaplin Hills to the west, and eventually Liana de Spolk says, if we're going to make a stand, this is the place to do it mm-hmm. because we have water and they don't. And, I mean, that was quite literal. The Federal Army, especially Charles Gilbert's corps coming in on the Springfield Road, they're falling apart in terms of, of unit cohesion, in terms of morale, uh, in terms of occasional mutinies against officers. I mean, that army is coming unglued because of the lack of water. So on the morning of October 8th, the Federals have discovered that the Confederates are protecting some of those springs. Mm. And the battle begins as a fight over water. Right. And so, you know, the largest battle that takes place in the state of Kentucky, the one that I think really decides whether Kentucky would remain in the Union or joins the Confederacy, is shaped by desperately thirsty men who need a regular water supply. Mm-hmm. In the movies, that wouldn't be a factor at all. I think in the newspapers back home, that's not much of a factor either. Battles were supposed to be about will yeah. and courage and right. heroism. Right. But you need to drink <laughs> and you need to eat and you need to feed your animals if you're going to move your artillery around. So all of those environmental factors related to that drought in some ways almost pushed those two armies to Perryville and then yeah. shaped the battle that followed. Yeah. I'll never forget, um, Ken, um, uh, reading the McCord diary. Do you ever remember that? The uh, young boy from Springfield, mm-hmm. Kentucky, who gets on his horse, whose the name of the horse is Blucher. This is after the fighting right. is over at Perryville. And he goes to see what, what, what it looked like. And, um, I mean, the, some of those descriptions are just breathtaking, really. But he winds up down near the Squire Bottom House. And there is where Doctor's Fork of, yes. uh, runs. And Doctor's Fork is one of those forks of the Chaplin River that, uh, where there were pools of water. In fact, it could be argued that it's that those pools that precipitated the fighting and really dictated Bragg making his stand there uh, because there were some po- uh, pools of water there. But the, this McCord diary, he records how he was, he got thirsty himself and um, he saw a pool of water in front of the bottom house and he goes and drinks out of it. And within seconds, he throws it all up. Yes sicker than a dog. And you go, that's what they fought the battle over. Yes. And the answer is yes. Shows you how bad it was. It's bad in another way, too. Um, Many years ago when I was working on the Perryville book, Kurt Holman, who was the wonderful park (laughs) manager at Perryville for years and years, showed me a study that he had discovered. And it actually charted the deaths of wounded after the battle. So in the first two or three days after the battle, and there's an obvious spike as men are succumbing to their wounds. And then there's a period where things seem to be going pretty well. They've survived the initial shock. But then there's another spike in depth, deaths that comes about a week later. And the conclusion of the doctor who wrote the article was that what you're dealing with there was essentially doctors who had performed operations or were at least trying to keep men alive without water. So not only did they not have water for the wounded, they weren't washing their hands either. And so they're just spreading germs around those hospitals, which were all over that part of Boyle County. And you've got the second wave of death that still would have happened, but probably not to that degree had there been adequate water supplies in and around Berryville. That's incredible. Kurt was a great superintendent. Absolutely. Um, I I fondly, fondly remember him. Um, So we've talked about Perryville here as 
as Bragg retreats out of Kentucky after Perryville, what happens weather-wise? <laughs> well, weather-wise, you get one of those freak occurrences that that marks, I think, the difference between weather and climate. I think Mark Twain once said that weather happens every day, climate happens all the time. You take all those averages of weather and you put together climate. There are always fluky things that happen in the weather. So what happens after Perryville, Bragg retreats eventually toward Cumberland Gap. Uh, Buell is supposed to follow. He's under tremendous pressure from Washington to follow. But again, he's, he's, he's wary of going into East Tennessee because of the drought, food, and forage. He wants to go to Nashville. He thinks that makes more sense. Uh, uh, late in October, I think it was the 26th, uh, around the time that he's about to lose his command, there's this massive snow system that moves across the Confederacy. And what was neat about using uh, the Smithsonian records is that in this case and others, but certainly in this case, I was able to do exactly what the founders of that project had hoped would happen mm -hmm. back in the 1840s and 50s. I tracked that storm. And you can follow it from Arkansas, where it slowed down Confederate operations. You can follow it into Kentucky and Tennessee, where you've got men in both armies waking up one morning, discovering that <laughs> they're covered with snow because there's been this, this <laughs> unexpected snowfall overnight. And it keeps moving up toward Virginia and Maryland. It turns into rain at a certain point, but that becomes the rain that affects uh, George McClellan's operation to get Abraham Lincoln off his back by finally crossing <laughs> the Potomac. So, I mean, here you could follow a storm across the Confederacy that affected all three of the major theaters of the war. Yeah, yeah. But then the drought returns. Um, I mean, it doesn't end at that point. Uh, when you get up to looking at, say, uh, the Stones River campaign, water levels in the Cumberland River are so low that – William Rosecrans, who replaces Buell, is having trouble feeding and supplying his army because they're dealing with that drought really up until December. Yeah. Well, you know, to summarize the Perryville experience, whether dictated where that battle yes. was fought, it dictated how that battle was fought. Um, we were talking earlier this morning about the acoustical shadow. Yes. Uh, that occurred. And you might briefly tell the audience about about the acoustical shadow at Perryville. Well, acoustic shadow is a fascinating phenomenon. It's, it's technically called sound refraction. And if you've got a certain topography and ground cover, if you've got wind blowing in a certain direction, sound can be enhanced or retarded depending on where you are. So on that day, Don Carlos Buell, federal commander, is between two and three miles from the actual fighting. Reclining on his cot, he had been thrown off his horse uh, by a hungry soldier in a field, speaking of, of mutiny and an army coming apart. And aside from some artillery, he cannot hear the battle, which is going on really from, from two in the afternoon until night. That's west of the battlefield. If you go east of the battlefield, uh, people in Danville and Harrodsburg could hear it very well because the sound essentially was blowing in that direction. And as, as a friend of ours, Daryl Young, pointed out to me years ago, that still happens around Perryville. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the day of the reenactment, if the wind is blowing in the right direction, you can find spots where you can't, can't hear it at all or where you can hear it very well. And we tend to associate acoustic shadow with Perryville, but it pops up again and again yeah. in Civil War battles and confuses officers and creates havoc and, and does all the things you might imagine right. when a general does not know that his army is fighting. Yeah. So the weather dictated where the battle was fought. There it dictated how mm -hmm. the battle was fought. And it also dictated when they disengaged. And um, under what circumstances would they have to disengage now? They just can't stay in that area anymore. No. I mean, it, it determines the fact that Bragg has to retweet, retreat to Tennessee. He's been hoping to move back to a place, Camp Dick Robinson. The Confederates called it Camp Breckenridge. 
Bragg moved his army there, united with Edmund Kirby Smith, thinking they would have enough food and forage to hold out in Kentucky for a while. Mm -hmm. And because of the drought and local conditions and the fact that some of those areas had already been foraged out once or twice, they didn't have three days of supplies. Mm -hmm. So there was no choice but to give up Kentucky and retreat yeah. back into Tennessee. Yeah. So from first to last, that campaign is absolutely shaped by by weather conditions and unusual weather conditions in 1862. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, it, let's let's talk about um, – we've talked about heat. <laughs> and I, I suppose the, the temperatures during the fighting at Perryville in that drought were, you know – just tremendous heat. Yes. And um, which then, of course, as they're retreating, it gets snow. And yes. So, <laughs> um, let's talk about another battle that was fought in tremendous heat, and that's first Manassas uh, in uh, northern Virginia, the first major, really major land engagement of the war. Uh, give us a little insight into weather matters with respect to first Manassas. When you go back to First Manassas, you're dealing with the very first federal commander of the Army of the Potomac, and that's Urban McDowell. McDowell has spent much of his recent career in Washington. Mm -hmm. Washington is an extension of northern Virginia. So he understands the weather there generally, and he knows that the hottest part of the summer in northern Virginia tends to be middle of July. So, as I think everyone listening probably knows, McDowell wanted time to train his army before he took it out against the Confederates down at Manassas, but Abraham Lincoln refused to allow him that time, essentially ordered him to move south. So then McDowell says, well, at least we need to get going before we reach the hottest part of the summer. But that doesn't happen. There are all sorts of delays in terms of transportation, horses, supplying men, getting enough food for them. So when the, the Federals finally move out of, of the Washington area toward Manassas, McDowell knows that they're moving at the hottest part of the summer. And who are we talking about here? We're talking about men on both sides, really, who have been in uniform, oh, maybe three months They've done some rudimentary training. They have really no idea what they're doing. Um, so that army does not move very quickly at all. And the story we were always told as kids was that it was because of poor discipline. They were jumping out of line and stealing blackberries and that sort of thing. And, and it happened. But, you know, blackberries are a source, source of moisture of nothing else. Um, both of those armies – suffered tremendously because of the heat. So by the time they got to Manassas, they were, they were pretty much worn out as it was. And then during the battle itself, because it is so dry, there are these massive dust clouds that rise up. And generals on both sides are completely misinterpreting these dust clouds. Because mm -hmm. when you see a dust cloud, you know that there are men out there and horses out there. So... You know, the Confederates are wondering, has the Harpers Ferry garrison showed up? Look at all that <laughs> dust out there. Well, it had not. The Harpers Ferry garrison was sitting very comfortably in Harpers Ferry at that time. But there's all of this confusion that has to do with heat and dust. Um, historian Mark Smith, who teaches at the University of South Carolina, wrote a fascinating article about First Manassas, about how the dust and the heat essentially affected vision. It affected how well you could see color. We know that at Manassas, men were confused by uh, the hodgepodge of new uniforms. There's no standardization yet. The flags look too much alike. But then you throw in all the heat and the dust and the gunpowder that's, that's hovering Close in the, the heat ground. over that field, yeah. and there's absolute confusion. So again, we know the Manassas story. But we know it better if we factor in the heat and yeah. the dust and atmospheric conditions. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. And then to shift gears to uh, winter, cold, um, you've got Jackson's campaign, Stonewall Jackson's mm -hmm. campaign to Romney uh, early in the war. And what is it that affects that campaign? 
There's a debate that goes on among meteorologists who are interested in history, and we're not going to settle it today. I don't think we're going to settle it anytime <laughs> soon. But it's clear that what we call ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, is acting during the war years. There used to be a theory that uh, most of the Civil War was fought in a La Nina period. More recently, people have suggested El Nino. Whatever was happening, it produces strange weather, as we know from watching the Weather Channel or our local weather on, on television. And December of 1861, weather-wise, was a very unusual month. It, slow, it snowed early, but then it became incredibly warm and spring-like. And, you know, not just the sort of normal Indian summer we might have. People are riding, women are riding their soldiers, husbands and, and sons, saying, it's crazy around here. We've got, you know, the flowers are coming up. Daffodils are coming up in December. We don't know what to think about this. You know, Mama's 64 and she's never seen anything like this. <laughs> so you've got this incredibly warm period. It becomes a little more moderate uh, toward and after Christmas. But the point is the weather is really good, unusually good, in December of 1861. So Jackson, who is itching to do something offensively anyway, he wants to protect Winchester and the Valley by you know, pushing up toward Bath and Romney and, and, and checking the Federals up there. He thinks now's a perfect time to march my men up there and, and deal with those Federal troops. Mm -hmm. So they leave on January 1st, 1862. It is so warm and pretty that morning. That these guys who, again, are you know, they're fairly new soldiers, they're throwing away their equipment and throwing away their coats. And ominously that afternoon, the sky turns dark and it starts to get cold. And they march themselves into an extended period of snow, sleet, <laughs> very cold temperatures, and, and barely survive it, <laughs> barely survive it. Um, I mean, they actually get to where they're going. They discover the towns are basically deserted. They're, they're living in houses with the windows smashed out by the Federals before they left. Uh, there's dissension within Jackson's army because Jackson takes his Stonewall Brigade back to Winchester where they can, you know, live okay. But he, he leaves some other troops in Bath and Romney and they're in horrible shape. And so, I mean, the entire campaign basically falls apart. Because in 1861, you can't predict the weather. Right. All you can do is go by standard past experience, which we call climate, and you look out the window and you see what's happening and you think, oh, well, it's going to be warm for the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. So, yeah. I mean, Jackson at one point threatens to resign. There's this question about with pulling him back to Richmond. Uh, there might never have been the Stonewall Jackson that we know had Richmond gone ahead with that, uh, all because of this this freak cold snap. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll start talking a little bit about rain. <laughs> Rain's important. Uh, you're, you're the, the title of your book, The Howling Storm. That's a quote from Henry Kidd Douglas. It is. Uh, a a terrific character in the Civil War who wrote a, a remarkable memoir. Uh, I rode with Stonewall, or as Bud Robertson used to say, <laughs> Stonewall, Stonewall rode, rode with, with me. me. <laughs> <laughs> I love Kid Douglas. He went to the same law school I did. Did he really? Yeah, he did. Um, but um, he he writes about the howling of the storm um, while on the peninsula. Yes. And that's the campaign of George McClellan um, in 1862, um, trying to move from uh, Fort Monroe up to Richmond and try to seize the capital of the Confederacy. And um, he is um, stalled at Fair Oaks, uh, just south of Richmond. And then with the wounding of Joe Johnson, Joseph E. Johnston, uh, Robert E. Lee becomes commander of the— uh, of what is going to be called the Army of Northern Virginia. And um, he, um, uh, Lee attacks, a series of attacks over the course of seven days, ending at Malvern Hill. So tell the, tell the listeners a little bit about the weather that these people were, were campaigning in. Sure. Um, what essentially happens in the Peninsula Campaign, 
On average, it rains every other day as McClellan moves his army from Fort Monroe up toward Richmond. Um, the amount of rain is is more than the previous year. It's not significantly more. The problem here is the frequency. It never dries out. So not only are creeks flooded and that swampy ground up the peninsula is flooding, but it never has an opportunity really to dry out, save during one period uh, after the Battle of Williamsburg, which was fought in a howling storm, and to be sure. So the federal army is bogging down. They're also pursuing Johnston's retreating Confederates who are chewing up the roads as they go. Mm -hmm. By the time the Federals get to where the Confederates have been, the situation is even worse in terms of mud, in terms of dead horses, which are sinking into this earth. Um, Much of the Confederacy consists of red clay soil called altasol. It has a very, very deep, solid level, which means almost anything in the Civil War era could could sink into it up to its ears. Uh, red clay is particularly bad on the peninsula because you throw in all that sand. It's a coastal environment. Yeah. It's a different kind of red clay. So McClellan's army is moving through muck almost every day until they get up to Fair Oaks and then – Fair Oaks is fought where it is because all the waterways are flooded. And there's confusion on both sides in terms of, well, which road should we take? You know, where are the bridges? Is there a bridge we can use to get across Chickahominy <laughs> Creek? Um, so the entire campaign up to that point is shaped by this 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 constant rain. And then it does dry out for a while. Um, when Lee goes out to fight McClellan in the Seven Days Battles at the end of June, first part of July – Um, You've got thunderstorms, but it's generally hot and dry. But then the night of the final battle, the bloodiest battle, the Battle of Malvern Hill, um, it starts raining again. And that's the night that Kid Douglas goes out and talks about looking for the wounded, finding the wounded and the dying and the dead in the middle of this howling storm. Uh, all the while, the federal army, McClellan, has has given up on offensive operations. He's retreating uh, a few miles downriver to a place called Harrison's Landing, where that's the farthest point that the U.S. Navy can get upriver with gunboats. Right. Right. And they're retreating through this storm. They're moving through the night. And I thought it was fascinating when I was writing about this passage, this point in the war. Uh, you will find many federal commanders in the official records who will talk about the battles But they all talk about how horrible that night was Mm. and how brave their men were. And isn't it remarkable that we managed to keep our units together in that terrible storm going back to Harrison's Landing? Except when you read the Confederate accounts, you get the impression that the the Federal Army wasn't maintaining much cohesion at all. Mm. D.H. Hill talks about all of the the wagons and horses and and field pieces and everything else that they just abandoned that horrible, horrible night. In some ways, I think it, it... it's a terrible exclamation point yeah. on the Seven Days campaign. Yeah. The uh, War Department just told McClellan, get home, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> Eventually, the War Department determined that uh, – actually, McClellan, to his credit, comes up with a fairly interesting plan, a second campaign on Richmond, which would have involved going to Petersburg, cutting off yeah. communications and moving north, which, of course, is exactly what U.S. Grant does in 64 <laughs> and 65. But by that point, McClellan had, had surely – worn out his welcome in the White House. Yeah. One other uh, campaign where you see a lot of rain, um, but also sleet, is Fredericksburg. Oh, yes. And here you've got Ambrose Burnside commanding the Army of the Potomac. And on the 13th of December, he attacks uh, the Confederate lines that are really almost formidable. Um, And... Uh, suffers a really disastrous losses. And, um, but then in January, decides he can strike Lee's flank by moving along the Rappahannock River uh, and then crossing at Banks's Ford and trying to strike Lee. Tell the viewer what happened to Burnside's army. Burnside wants to move again against Lee. And the weather is actually pretty good again that December, December 1862, probably for the same climatic conditions. 
but he's he's hamstrung. A lot of his generals are going up to the White House. They're convincing President Lincoln that the army doesn't have faith in Burnside. Lincoln reigns in Burnside for a while. Finally, when he decides to let him go, it's January. Burnside's men move out of their camps. They move to cross uh, the Rappahannock and go after Lee upriver. And lucky man that he is, Ambrose Burnside encounters not one but two major storm systems, <laughs> which slam into each other over northern Virginia, and the bottom falls out, and it rains incessantly for days. And the federal army quite literally gets stuck in the mud hmm. and are eventually – able to extricate themselves, but there's no way they can get across the river. They've lost surprise. The Confederates are across the bank laughing at them, uh, making obscene <laughs> signs and holding them up. It's, it's <laughs> terrible. And so they eventually just retreat back to their camps as well as they can. Uh, soldiers, we talked about horses and mules trying to pull wagons, caissons, artillery pieces through this this swamp, essentially, dying in droves. Soldiers said, you could, you could walk back to our camps just going from dead horse to dead horse to mm -hmm. dead horse. It's a terrible, terrible experience for the Army of the Potomac. It crossed Ambrose Burnside, his job. Mm -hmm. And I think it shook that army to the core, not just the rain and the mud, but the failure and the ridicule and as you know well, Kent, because you've written about this in, in you know, three different books now, when the Federals finally turn back the Confederates at Gettysburg, mm -hmm. when Pickett's charge fails, the Federals come out of their positions and they shout, what? Fredericksburg. Yeah. Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. We yeah. remember what you guys did to us at Fredericksburg. Yeah. It's not that they, they come out and they're, they're yelling Chancellorsville right. or, or second Manassas. It's, it's that humiliation in the rain, I think, during the mud march, as much as that terrible defeat in the cold but not freezing conditions on, on the day of the battle itself. Yeah. Oh, there's, a, there's an example, again, of an, of an army commander being taken down, sacked. By, his, by the president, uh, in large measure because of weather. Yes. He did the same, they did the same to Don Carlos Buell as yes. a result of the Kentucky campaign, largely because of weather. They, they sacked him. Um, George McClellan on the peninsula. Uh, it's, a, it's another repeat. Weather dict had in part dictated what happened to him being taken down as commander. Um, it's stunning. It is. Well, you know, as Brooke Simpson wisely points out, there's a period around February, March 1863 where the White House is very close to being fed up with U.S. Grant at Vicksburg, who is stuck mm -hmm. uh, trying to find a way around Vicksburg, all those failed canal projects and, oh, yeah. and trying to establish you know, a, different, a different water route uh, around Vicksburg so they don't have to deal with, with the city. I mean – you know, the, I mean, the administration sends Charles Dana out there to find out what the heck is going on. I think Grant's Grant's command is endangered for a few days because of the combination of weather that winter and that that silty soil, that lowest soil that you'll find around Vicksburg. Yeah. So, I mean, even even Grant at one point um, is in danger of losing his army over the weather, which I think is why he has a strong tendency to mm -hmm. ignore the weather and keep pushing during the Overland campaign. Right. We save this for last, and that's Gettysburg. Um, uh, tell tell the viewer what the what what did the weather dictate in that campaign? Sure. Sure. Well, first of all, late in June, toward the end of the month, but not at the end of the month, it's incredibly hot in Virginia. It's especially hot east of the Blue Ridge, mm -hmm. which means that the federal army is bearing the brunt of that heat. It's tough enough for Lee west of the Blue Ridge, but it's really rough for the federals, for Hooker's army. So they're falling out in droves. There's, there's a, there's a three-day period on the march to Gettysburg where, you know, 
hundreds of men are falling out by the side of the road, some of them dying mm -hmm. from heat exhaustion. Oh, yeah. So th that, I think, wears them out to an extent already. Then there's a rainy period, right? at the end of the month. There's a rainy period right before the battle starts. In fact, there's still mud on the field on July 1st. Right. Weather during the battle itself, it's warm, but it's actually not unseasonably hot until the third day. Mm -hmm. It's hot enough on July 3rd that as Pickett's men are lining up, um, some of them are, are collapsing from heat stroke, although as Carol Reardon would point out, a lot of them seem to have been faking heat stroke as well. Because <laughs> I'm afraid I probably would have. Too. Yeah, they, they they didn't want to go across that field and oh look, Bob just fainted. Maybe I could too. Oh, God. So they fight the battle. They sit there the next day. Lee's waiting to see what Meade's going to do. Meade's army is like cheat up. He can't do a whole lot really. Then it starts raining. And with the exception of roughly two days, it rains during the rest, the rest of the campaign. It rains during the entire retreat. And the story of the retreat has been told very well by Kent Brown, among others. Uh, Lee's trying to get across the Potomac back into Virginia. Meade's under heavy pressure from Washington to stop him, destroy that army north of the Potomac, win the war by destroying Lee's army. Um, and that's when weather and mud become incredibly important. Lee takes his army back through the Blue Ridge Passes and heads south toward the Potomac, toward Falling Waters and Williamsport. And it's, it's hard going, especially with wagons full of the wounded. Mm -hmm. And as, as, you, as you brilliantly pointed out in Retreat from Gettysburg, they're taking food, supplies, horses, everything – that they can they can glean from Pennsylvania. You made an argument that I've used in class since that book came out that the booty they brought back from Pennsylvania probably extended the life of the Confederacy yeah. maybe six months. Yeah. So it's really important to get all that stuff across the Potomac. When they get there, the bridges are gone. The river is rising because of all of this rain. It seems like a wonderful opportunity to destroy Lee's army. The problem is Meade's path is even worse. He makes the decision to come down the turnpike. Makes sense to me. It's what I would have done. Use the turnpike, move south for a while, and then cross the passes to the south once you get into Maryland. So he arrests his army for a day, and then they move. And they're, they're confused by Lee's movement, so they, they make a false start, and they come back, and they finally move down the turnpike. They're moving through a different soil comp composition. They're moving through a little finger of that southern red clay that pokes up into Pennsylvania, slams right into Little Round Top. The next time our listeners are, are at, uh, at Gettysburg, they should go look for it. You can find it very easily, that, mm -hmm. that red clay underneath the grass. Uh, traffic jams invariably occur. Wagons and artillery batteries and the like start getting off the road. We'll go through this field. They get bogged down. They make pretty good time, but they wear out their animals. And after that, Meade's army is moving at a crawl mm -hmm. because they're moving through bad soil, heavy rain. Um, they do not get to the Potomac as quickly as they might have otherwise. And both armies are, are in terrible condition. And then, of course, when Meade gets there, he discovers that Lee has created a line of entrenchments that, that dwarfs anything they saw at Fredericksburg. Yeah. I would have taken pause too. Mm -hmm. But there's a break in the weather. The Potomac starts to sink. Then it starts raining again. The Potomac starts to rise again. And Lee makes the decision, this might be a good place to fight otherwise, but we better yeah. take this window. Takes his army back into Virginia. Um, the war goes on. Meade never regains the favor of Washington, really. Uh, it's a turning point in the war, but not in the way we tend to think of. We want to believe that Gettysburg is the great, the great turning point. The war goes on another two years. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the damage done to Lee's army, in terms of um, the damage done to Meade's reputation, the eventual arrival of U.S. Grant, the war changes in so many days. Would all of those things that happened without all that rain, we'll never know. I'm not a what-if historian, yeah. but it's hard to believe that you would have the same sequence of events. Yeah. To give you a, the, the listener a, a glimpse, the, the Potomac River, when Lee's army entered Maryland from 
what is now West Virginia, um, at Williamsport and Falling Waters. The Potomac was three feet deep there at the, at the fords. Uh, by the time Lee reached Williamsport during the retreat, it was 16 feet deep. Yes. Just from rain. And we know exactly how much it rained in Gettysburg. We can assume it was fairly similar down on the Potomac yeah. because one of those Smithsonian weather observers is in, is in Gettysburg. Yeah, right. And as right. I said earlier, he's, he's, he's making meticulous yeah. notes about how much it's raining. And it's, it's a remarkable amount. Yeah. I found a diary, by the way. Uh, you probably saw this in my retreat book and in the Mead book. A diarist in um, Hagerstown who meticulously recorded everything about the weather, nothing else, just the weather. And I don't know, after listening to you, I wonder whether he was doing that for, you know, the, the Smithsonian or whatever, but it was a diary devoted to nothing but weather, what the, whether it was raining, heat, uh, how hot it was, how cold it was. Um, and of course, it's just Total, the most valuable thing in the world to cite in order to get a glimpse as to just what these guys were going through. It's, yeah. it's valuable to us now because we're asking those questions. Uh, you mentioned Bud Robertson a few minutes ago, one of my former instructors. You and I both dearly loved Bud. We, oh, lo yeah. we lost him a few years ago. Yeah. But I remember him talking about his frustrations. He'd finally tracked down a Stonewall Brigade diary, and he thought, here's finally what I need. And he was just so frustrated, he said, there was nothing in it but weather data. <laughs> <laughs> Years later, that was exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. And actually, he grew to become a weather guy he did. in terms of, he did. of Civil War uh, 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 storytelling. He, um, he even gave a speech to the Kentucky Civil War Roundtable maybe 10, 15 years ago on weather. And I always thought a, a book would come out on it from him. But it took you, Ken. It took me instead. <laughs> well, he was also very interested in animals toward the end of his career. And, I mean, the effect that the war itself, but certainly weather conditions had on, on animals in the war is something we haven't explored very much at all. There have been a couple of conference sessions. Earl Hess has a new uh, edited book out. But, I mean, the estimates are, are – what a million horses and mules died oh, yeah. Easy. during the war. Easy. Some Easy. from some from their wounds, some yeah. from disease like glanders, but a lot of them just from the horrible conditions. Yeah. I mean, we think about in Kentucky as a horse state. We think about Missouri as a state producing mules. It took years and years after the Civil War to get back to those eighteen sixty numbers. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it takes a lot to keep a horse or a mule going. First of all, and if you don't keep them going with what, what they need every day, you're going to lose him. Mm -hmm. They're that, they, they're, they live on a tenuous thread, really. And it's all a matter of are you keeping up with that animal, um, keeping him fed, keeping him shod, uh, putting shoes on him, iron shoes, of course. you you got to keep all that going yeah. or that poor thing will just collapse. And I've never done it statistically. I can't give you a graph. I can't give you numbers. But having worked on this project, I have a, I have a gut sense that animal deaths increased during winter campaigns. Yeah, sure. You throw in the cold. You throw in the mud. You throw sure. in the snow. Uh, it just killed them in droves. Sure. sure. Ken, it's been a pleasure. Just an absolute pleasure having you here. And um, um, it's a fascinating topic. And for everybody out there, um, the author is Kenneth No N O E. The book is *The Howling Storm: Weather, Climate, and the American Civil War*. Go out and get yourself a copy. Thank you very much. Kenneth. Thank you, Kent. Okay. Become an American hero who participates in our mission by joining us at witnessinghistory.org. Download our documentaries and free teacher education materials that conform to grade level education standards at pbslearning.org. Follow Witnessing History on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn.